that really sets the perfect tone for our next guest. <laughs> really an incredible uh, woman who I admire. I admire her because I can't keep up with her. <laughs> if you go to Canterbury, she's still walking. Walking very fast around the campus. I tried to catch her this week. She doesn't know this, but could find her if she was too fast for me. <laughs> she wrote a good, beautiful piece that was in the paper this week, in my view. It's very, very touching, and it's based on writing that she uh, had and has written down uh, um, <coughs> in order to preserve uh, the, the important history of what she went through. And she's going to share a little bit about that. Um, but as uh, I was talking to her during the service, she said, there's one thing you have to say about me. Of all the things I did in my life, one of the most important things is I helped to found this congregation. And I thought that that was an amazing thing with all the many accomplishments that you'll hear about over her life. Uh, Ruth treasures this community that I, especially after such difficult days that she was able to build something. And it's a real honor when you have a community such as this uh, that I guess is uh, <coughs> over 60, 70 years old at this point. Uh, so much history, so many people helped to build it, so many different stories. So I'm going to encourage Ruth to come up. Uh, with Diane. You should know, in her 100th birthday, what, when, when was it, Tom? It's gonna be on Tuesday. Tuesday is her 100th birthday. Oh. That, you know, all things, you can applaud for that. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I would like to thank the Buffalo News for publishing an abbreviated version because of limited space in the paper of my first-hand account of Kostana. I'm now going to share with you the full version. November 9th and 10th, 1938, eight years ago tonight, and just four days before my 20th birthday. The destruction of synagogues, the Jewish homes and businesses oh, thank you. in Germany came to be known as Kostana, the night of the broken glass. Not loving. Wait a minute. The assassination of a German diplomat by a 70 year old German born Polish Jew provided the pretext for these attacks on Jews by the Nazis. Kostana was a turning point for Jews in Germany. Hitler finally had the excuse he had been waiting for to launch a campaign of terror against the Jews. Before I tell you about my personal experience of Kostana, I would like to tell you about the events that led up to it. There were a great many Polish Jews living in Germany in 1938. According to my recollection, <coughs> They, nor their children, who had been born in Germany, were allowed to become German citizens. They were simply considered of Polish nationality or being stateless. However, one night, without warning, all the Polish Jews were rounded up and shipped to Poland. When they arrived at the border, they were denied entrance into Poland. There they were in November, cold and hungry, without food or shelter, in no man's land. Somehow, one of the women got a letter out to her brother, 
who was studying in Paris, telling him of their plight. When he read the letter, he went berserk, got a gun, and went to the German embassy with the intention of killing the consul. Instead, the first man he met was an attaché whom he shot at point blank range. When the man died two days later, Hitler finally had the excuse he had been waiting for to launch a campaign of terror against the Jews. At the time, I was staying with a family in Düsseldorf, Germany, an hour away from my parents. The first indication of the impending horror was a howling mob which gathered in front of the house where I was staying. This was followed by the sound of breaking glass and the sickening crash of a door being kicked in. Four or five men stomped into the room. They were not wearing Nazi uniforms. Most likely, they had been ordered to leave their uniforms at home so as to look like ordinary citizens, venting their just wrath against the Jews for the crime in Paris. They proceeded to throw everything they could lay their hands on. They threw everything out the windows. Furniture, crystal, china, silver, clothes, even a piano. Everything was hurled through the shattered windows, very much to the approval of the cheering mob in the street below. No sooner had they left when two armed stormtroopers appeared and arrested my host. The way they barked orders, they seemed like a two-man firing squad. I heard my breath. I thought they were going to execute him right then and there. Instead, he was dragged off to a concentration camp along with 30,000 other Jewish men and teenage boys including my sister's husband and his brother. I, I don't know what possessed me, but I went down into the street to see if anything could be salvaged, only to be driven back by the jeering mob, screaming obscenities at me. I remember a young girl threw a scarf at me and suggested that I hang myself with it. Strange enough, I saw no looting. After all, these were well disciplined Germans obeying orders. Either that, or by the time these things reached the street from the second floor from which they had been heard, there was nothing left worth picking up. I found out later that they were not so reluctant about looting Jewish-owned stores. This doesn't work very well. Which was much more lucrative. The newspaper reported that these good Germans were collecting items to donate to the poor. Yeah, right. <laughs> then, adding insult to injury, the Jews were forced to pay for all the broken glass and damage done during those two nights of terror. My only thought now was to get home to my parents, who lived an hour away. I grabbed my passport and stuffed it inside my bra in case my purse was searched. I didn't know what they would do 
if they found out I was Jewish. I thought we would have to flee the country immediately, and my panic haven't completely forgotten that there was no place to flee to. Virtually all countries had closed their borders to the Jews by then. In 1938-1939, the U.S., German, and Austrian quotas were completely filled. Having a sponsor was no good until your quota number came up. Mine took 10 years to come up, even though I applied for my quota number just two weeks after my sister did, and she came to this to the United States 10 years before me. On my way to the railroad station, I saw flames and realized that the beautiful old synagogue had been set on fire. In the distance, I heard the cheering and laughter of the crowd as they found ever new victims. Very much to my relief, I found my parents unharmed and nothing had been disturbed. Perhaps this was because not long before, we had been forced out of the large house my grandfather had built in 1870. We had then moved into a tiny apartment in a neighboring city where we were not known. However, <coughs> excuse me, our Jewish landlords apartment had been ransacked and his valuable paintings slashed to ribbons. After having lived through unspeakable horrors and degradations, most of the Jewish men who had been rounded up during Kristallna were eventually released from the concentration camps, except for those whose ashes were sent to their families. My sister and her husband were fortunate to leave for the United States shortly thereafter. His brother tried to flee to Switzerland, where he had family, and was never heard from again. A few months later, I was fortunate to escape to England where I survived as a maid and later as a waitress. For my parents, it was too late. They were trapped in Germany and perished in Auschwitz, as did my oldest sister. She had foreseen the impending horror and had fled to neighboring Holland shortly after Hitler came to power in 1933. But there she thought she would be safe, and she was, until the Nazis overran her life. In accordance with the United States quota system, established in 1924, the United States admitted 27,370 refugees from Germany in 1939. That number was reduced by 93 percent to just 1,966 in 1942. Just think how many Jews could have been saved if it had not been for the closed borders. For those of us who thought when we could wait out the Hitler era, Kostana was a way God call. It was those who could to get out of Germany. Unfortunately, for most, it was too late. None of us could have foreseen the final solution. After
after the end, the war ended while waiting for my United States quota number to come up. I returned to Germany. I was, a, I was attached to the US Army as an Allied civilian employee, working first in censorship and later as a translator at the Nuremberg trials. In the fall of 1948, my United States quota number finally came up and I left Germany for good for the United States where I have lived for the last 70 years. Having been born just two days after the armistice was signed, ending World War I, I will turn 100 years old next week. Grateful to have lived this long to tell the tale. And nothing like this ever happened again. Happy birthday to you.